What it, what is it that makes humans human? What is it what is it that makes babies able to do this miraculous thing that they do in their first couple of years of mastering this system that turns out to be just unimaginably complex? I mean, until you try to write down the grammar of the language that they have even by age three, you don't realize what a what an amazing what amazing little innate scientists they are to to, to figure out this, the structure of the, the language surrounding them. Welcome everyone to today's interview, where I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Barbara Parti. She is Distinguished uh, University Professor Emerita of Linguistics and Philosophy at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and her work is focused on uh, primarily on formal semantics and language. Her books include um, The Fundamentals of Mathematics for Linguistics, Subject and Object in Modern English, Mathematical Models, uh, Mathematical Methods in Linguistics, and uh, Compositionality in, in Formal Semantics. That's a uh, select, selected papers of, of, her, of her work. Um, she also has a kind of variety of, of published articles on these on these issues. Uh, feel free to add anything or correct anything. But uh, with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Partee. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So, yeah, I did want to cover a bunch of things. Uh, I just want to start with some kind of general questions about about uh, compositionality in semantics. And so, so broadly, as I understand it, the basic idea is that um, the meaning of some expression is determined by, well, the meanings of its parts and the words that go into it and how they're combined syntactically. Um, I mean, this, this to me seems broadly intuitive, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know, there's kind of two issues here. Where first, you recognize there's a variety of different ways to make this more precise, to understand um, this thesis more precisely, and two, there's you know potential challenges to it. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, from that, do you want to maybe expand on this? What are what are um, some of the issues that arise there, broadly speaking? Sure. Yeah. So so yes, it's really hard to argue with the general idea that the meaning of a sentence depends on the meanings of its parts and the way they're put together, but that statement is full of theory dependent terms. You have what meanings are, what syntactic structure is, what is a function of how that should be narrowed down. So potentially there's many, there's many different versions and, and some may be more controversial than others. So, um, so for instance, one, one uh, attractive idea that very few people actually believe, but I think some, some, some try to work this way, uh, would be that, that the, sentence structure would just be a nice, simple phrase structure tree breaking down the sentence that's actually pronounced into constituents, which have smaller constituents, etc. So a, a, a simple, basic phrase structure tree that might be generated by phrase structure grammar. And that compositionality would then say, okay, the semantic rules have got to be, have got to enable you to climb the tree, putting, having the pieces the meanings of the smallest pieces, and then putting them together bit by bit as you as you climb up climb up the tree. Uh, the way Quine in Philosophy of Logic says that uh, logic chases truth up the tree of grammar, you know that that kind of a that kind of a picture that that compositional semantics chases meanings up the up the tree of grammar. But there's there's relatively very few people who believe that a simple phrase structure grammar could be adequate for a natural language. So once the grammars are more complicated, then the question is of what kind of syntactic structure is guiding the, the uh, order in which you combine parts to get them to, to give you the meaning of the whole in the end, that, that becomes trickier. I remember in one of my, one of my early papers that was uh, working on combining Montague grammar with transformational grammar, where this idea of compositionality was was new to us before Mont 
we hadn't heard of it before Montague. I, I illustrated with three different ideas about how relative clauses combine with other parts of a noun phrase. And one, and, and these had all been around when I was a graduate student studying syntax. Uh, and one, one idea is you have a whole noun phrase, like the boy, and you have a sentence, then you turn it into who loves Mary, and you put that, that modified sentence together with that whole noun phrase to get the boy who loves Mary. And another idea is, no, the the is outside that whole thing. You're, you're doing the relative clause combination at a lower level. You put boy together with who loves Mary, and then you put on the the. And there's a still third idea I won't, I won't talk about because it's, it's a minority opinion for everyone, is that the relative clause combines with the the, and then they, com then they combine with the head noun boy. But those first two, does the relative clause combine with the whole noun phrase, or does it combine with the common noun part? Uh, that was that was a very live issue. And it turned out that, and, and syntax wasn't giving any clear arguments to, to decide one way or the other. But then, looking at the semantics, I learned this from Montague. I later realized Quine had proposed the same thing in word and object. Uh, that the, the common noun is basically a one-place predicate. Boy, the denotation is the set of boys. Who loves Mary is like a lambda abstract on a sentence. I don't know if that idea is familiar to your audience or not, but it's, it's kind of like, like a set formation kind of rule in this case, that who loves Mary gives you the set of things that love Mary. So that's also a one-place predicate. And if you take boy and who loves Mary, they both denote sets. And the rule for putting them together at that level is very simple. It's just set intersection. And so boy plus who loves Mary gives you the set of things that are boys and that love Mary. And that works beautifully. If you try to do it the other way that had seemed pretty much equally plausible syntactically and put together the boy and then try to add who loves Mary, the problem is that what the contributes, either as assertion or presupposition or something, is that there's one and only one such and such. So if you already put together the boy, you'd, you'd already have gotten this, this uh, part of the meaning telling you that there's one and only one boy. And then what do you do with who loves Mary? You, you, can't, you can't backtrack and say, oh, we, we don't mean there's only one boy. We mean there's only one boy who loves Mary. You can't undo stuff you've done, um, at least... I mean, that's, that's an important constraint on compositionality. You put things together, and as you build them up, you don't take stuff away that you've already done. So, in fact, that, that other structure, that would be fine for non-restrictive clauses. Like, the boy over there, comma, who loves Mary, comma, that's fine. Then you've got just one boy, and you're adding something as additional information. But for the basic restrictive relative clause, that was that was one of the first really nice clear cases that the requirement of compositionality as a requirement on the relation between syntax and semantics really narrows down your choices both for how you do the syntax and for how you do the semantics so it's not o not only is it a nice principle explains how how we can process sentences and interpret sentences we never heard before but it also is theoretically a nice thing to have in your in your linguistic toolkit for for figuring finding arguments for how you should do the syntax and how you should do the semantics yeah very good I, I, that that example made a lot of sense to me that was um that was helpful so, so I, I kind of a worry that comes up for me when you're thinking about um sort of grammatical rules um for um uh, getting sentence or expression meaning out of the more basic parts that that can be quite complex, but it's also, in principle, it could be, I mean, kind of varied, right? You could have different rules and with different speakers or different contexts or different times or different languages. Um, and there might be some commonalities, but I don't know. Do, is this something that comes up and how, how to think about just... Yes. Yeah. I mean, on one level, we could say, well, look, everything, all the work we do in linguistic analysis involves some idealization. You know, we... To, to, to get off the ground, we start by assuming we've got a homogeneous community all speaking the same language. Uh, 
And we know that's not true. And we know each of us probably has a, lot, a number of different grammars inside our head or grammars with variations in it because because we can adapt to other speakers pretty pretty easily so so that 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 part that part's just in general so so a, a given grammar is really well it's a grammar for yeah an idealized community that that the person whose grammar you're describing is part of you know assuming the community is is homogeneous enough um, but there but there are other factors that really are specific to the compositionality problem. And that has to do, I think you mentioned the word context. Because, because we don't we don't interpret sentences in a vacuum. I mean, I mean we we can, we're able to if if we but that's an unnatural task. Uh, so so lots of individual words are ambiguous and we're we're making we're making guesses of what what meaning of the word the speaker had in mind. Syntactic constructions can be ambiguous, and we're we're having to guess, you know, what which which construction of the ones that could underlie that sentence the speaker had in mind. But then also, uh, we have words like this and that, which don't have specific meanings of their own. They kind of point to the context in a way. They tell you, go find something in the context, figure out what the speaker was was indicating. Uh, and we have lots of, lots of cases. I remember having an interesting argument with Ed Keenan at a certain point, when when he was he was saying, "Well, look, when you take a word, an adjective like flat, and you put it together with different kinds of nouns, flat contributes different things. A flat note when you're singing is different from a flat tire, or a flat pancake, or a or a flat joke." <laughs> If you if you had that, um, and or a flat balloon, uh, so he said he said how can, how can you say you put the meanings together if you don't know what the meaning of flat is until you know what noun it's with, uh, and I remember in my earliest paper on compositionality I said well look you just have flat one flat two flat three flat four flat five, and in the dictionary we can talk about how these are all related to one another, but but you can you can disambiguate on the level of if you put it with this you use the, you get this flat if you put it with this you get this flat uh, but I mean it's, it's that's not a very satisfactory solution so so really there's a kind of negotiation going on all the time among these words that can have different meanings but you've got to you've got to be solving for many variables at once so to speak you're, you're trying to put the meanings together to get the bigger meanings and at the same time, you're trying to figure out which choices to make for the meanings of these particulars. You know, it's interesting to think about how ki- kids learn language. You know, if, if a kid he- hears a sentence with just one word in it that they don't know, they don't just stop short in putting together the meaning of the sentence. They they kind of put the meaning of the sentence together with sort of a variable in there, and they can then, if if the context tells them what it probably meant, like, like in Susan Carey's language acquisition experiments, where to to see how fast kids pick on, up on new words, she'll give them instructions like, "Go to the tray and bring me the chromium ball, not the yellow ball, but the chromium ball," presupposing they never heard the word chromium before, and they'll go bring the ball that's not yellow, <laughs> and 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 three weeks later it'll turn out that they remember that that color is called chromium. <laughs> it was great, but it's. It's like, like without without knowing the word chromium, they figured out what the whole sentence meant, and then sort of solved for the missing, missing variable in there that would get them that meaning. So we can run compositionality backwards, you know, to to figure out what people mean by individual words they use if we know enough of the rest of the sentence. Right, right, and it's, and it's capacities like that that like. That's what. That's how we're so effective, really. Um, especially when we're really young at language learning. Yeah. Right. Um, miracle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do want to come at a couple of more things related to compositionality, but um, just for kind of related to the last thing I asked, because um, I don't know. I, I get to thinking that you say that 
well, if we're thinking of a sort of idealized language, um, we're making certain assumptions which are not, which are not strictly true, but um, useful for, for theory, I suppose. Um, I don't know how, how much... To me, I, I don't know. I see, I see language as very vague, very messy, very... Um, and I, I, I worry about how relevant a very idealized model is going to be to language as it actually is. I mean, I don't know. Is this a worry that, that comes up for you or, or what do you think? Uh, about that? Well, not for me, but I know it exists. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I can remember when I was a student, you know, sort of one day just looking at a looking at a random paragraph in a newspaper and realizing, oh, the syntactic rules we've studied so far, I couldn't, I could not parse a single one of these sentences. <laughs> uh, so yeah, yeah. I mean, and then I thought, gee, you know, that I mean, we should be a little worried about that. Um, but the the people who do computational linguistics, I mean, that that's that may get as far afield because uh, it's not my own area, but it's been really it's really interesting. I mean, like um, they they have to worry about all those things, and there are debates, there are big debates in that area about how much of what linguists do is useful for them and how how much might work better if they just develop these machine learning algorithms and turn their computers loose with a gigantic corpus of examples and let it figure out what it thinks is going on without any help from linguists. And, and they're and for, for several decades, that was kind of a split in the computational linguistics field. I think now now people are figuring out how to get the best of both worlds. I, there was an occasion in which I was giving a little little 10-minute ten, ten spiel about progress in formal semantics over the last 50 years. Uh, and at the end, I, I, said, I said, oh, we've made tremendous progress in the things we understand now that we didn't understand 40 years ago. But I don't know whether we would really be helpful for Google Translate. Uh, and it turned out it turned out that Peter Norvig, the head of research at Google, was in the audience. And afterwards, he said to me, "Well, you know, we're starting to hire linguists. We're starting to hire, in fact, formal semanticists. You guys understand how negation works better than better than our algorithms do, because those algorithms depend so much on just similarity in." In terms of what words go together, and and a sentence with a negation in it is extremely similar in its co-occurrences to a sentence without a negation in it, or with a negation in a different spot, and and so the the Google kind of algorithms you know just see oh there's something negative here, right? and and so so understanding the parts about where the structure really makes a difference can be helpful and. And those two kinds of approaches are, are finally being looked at as complementary and not simply in competition. Right. I could I see how thinking about it more kind of structurally, the, the logical form, the where the, the scope of the of the negation operator goes, um, yeah. might be more effective than, than some of the other. In fact, if I if I could generalize, I I should I would say formal semantics is strongest in the areas of logical structure. And structure more generally, you could almost call it the semantics of syntax. And where it's where it's weakest is in the is in some basic parts of lexical semantics. It's I mean lexical semantics is a whole other topic you might want to ask me questions about at some point, but but some some parts of the lexical meaning are really very structural, knowing whether knowing whether a, a verb is uh, is 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 something that denotes an event or a state or a process, you know, that that makes a big difference for how it interacts with tense and aspect. But knowing the difference between walk and run is not usually on the radar of a formal semanticist. And that's sort of the, the, the core kernel lexical parts of lexical items. And that, that we don't have as much to say about. Right, okay. right. Um yeah, but a fair amount of language um, does have some some logical structure to it, um, to some degree. And there, the the you're, as you say, the formal semantics can be more relevant. You say that, that's what you hire us for. <laughs> <laughs>
Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so yeah, just I was thinking more about, about compositionality, and um, maybe this isn't quite right, but I don't know. Tell me what you think. Um, you know, I'm, what about the way that expressions are made, like various emphasis and um, other kind of non syntactic or linguistic means of information communication? Um, can that does that make a difference to, to the exp- meaning of the expression? And if so, does that potentially challenge compositionality? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, we, we always follow we always follow David Lewis's dictum of figure out what you want a meaning to do and then find something that will do that. And when you realize that focus, for instance, makes a huge difference. So if it's if it's John didn't invite Mary to the party, no, if it John didn't invite Mary to the party versus John didn't invite Mary to the party, those make two different assertions. Uh, and so that's, and they differ in their truth conditions, uh, at least in their presuppositions, because because we have to take presuppositions along with basic truth conditions. So that's part of meaning, and we've got to account for it. And same is true for a lot of things that are signaled by intonation, like, like uh, you can't take anyone to that party, or you can't take anyone to that party, as in just anyone, right? Uh, so there are things that are done with, with intonation that make a, a crucial difference. Things are done with stress patterns that make a crucial difference. And that's all got to come in. So so you have to find ways to represent that in the structure. So so people put focus marking. That's that's relatively simple. How to, how to represent the things that are going to lead to these intonational patterns is trickier, but it's certainly not impossible. Um, so... So all of all of those parts. I mean, there are some things that may be purely non-linguistic, like like it may be the expression on your face that tells somebody whether you're being sarcastic or not, and that's not directly in the meaning. That's that's on a kind of meta level of interpretation. That uh, we we'll we'll tell you what the literal truth condition for that sentence is, and and let somebody else figure out that. That's not what he actually meant. He's implying the opposite or whatever. Yeah. So so lots of lots of things make challenges to compositionality and it's and it's 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 part of the task of the researcher to figure out whether this is just one more level that we need to get into our structure and 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 work on it compositionally or is this is this something about the line between semantics and pragmatics? You know what's what's actual language content and what is some aspect of language use, and if so, how does that relate? Formal pragmatics, I mean, formal semantics is a younger field than syntax, and formal pragmatics is a younger field than formal semantics. But all these enrichments, you know, once you, once you figure out some basic stuff and you say, yeah, but we're still having puzzles from this, then then you get to the point where you can tackle you know, th- those those other dimensions. Right. And really a lot of this is focusing on like sentence meaning, right? Rather than what we might say is maybe speaker meaning and the pragmatics uh, side of things yeah. or Yes. And also also at least at the start there's been a at just as in syntax, there's been a focus on sentences rather than whole discourses. But uh, that also I mean, people have also gone beyond that, like like Hans Kamp, Hans Kamp's discourse representation theory right from the start. Was designed to deal with multi multi sentence discourses and the kinds of, of connections, even logical connections that can be found among sentences in a discourse. And a lot of people have worked on multi speaker discourses and how what go, how the common ground gets updated as people take turns and you accept or reject what the other person said. With Stalnicker opened the way for that kind of work with his all his work on on semantics and pragmatics and the common ground and the updating the common ground and then Irena Heim in her her innovations in semantic theory took a, incorporated a lot of that into the actual semantics and and made made the focus not just on truth conditions but on how um, the, how each piece of meaning is contributing to the 
the context change potential of a sentence. You know, thinking of a sentence as something that's going to be uttered in a certain context and it's going to have an effect in in updating or challenging or something the common ground in in that in that uh, context. So yeah, yeah, the the uh, the domains get wider, the tools get richer, and then of course it's. I mean, of course, when you're working on on one kind of problem, you don't want to have to have everything in the kitchen sink, you know, sort of keeping track of it all at once. But but when something's relevant, we, we we've got tools for dealing with it, or are are developing tools for dealing with it. Right, and 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 one one other potential challenge to um, compositionality, or at least certain views of it, um, comes from genitives, uh, nouns which are used to to indicate possession. Um, so, I could, does this include cases where um, some generative noun is is more like a longer phrase? Um, and it's not maybe not clear how compositionality is respected. How, how would you account for that? Well, well, let let me. I mean, even even ignoring whether some of them are phrases, even just with simple genitives like like uh, John's team. Uh, John's team can be the team John plays for, the team John uh, owns, the team he writes about for the local paper, uh, and you know, lots, and and really, it's kind of open ended. That's that's one that's one I started worrying about really early when I was worrying about compositionality, because I thought, well, well. Here's here's this big, sort of open parameter in there, and and the way the way that I I advocated dealing with it, and I think I still think something like this in some form or other is more or less right, that that there can be a free variable inside the meaning of the genitive construction, so it's like John's team, it's a definite noun phrase at least when it's used say as subject of a sentence, John's team is interpreted as the team, because it's definite, the team such that John bears relation R to it. And R is a variable that is not resolved by anything in the structure. It's got to be clear in the context to the speaker and the hearer by relevance or something else. If it's not, then the hearer may not understand the, the phrase the way the speaker intended it. Uh, but the but usually we're pretty we're remark. It's another thing we're remarkably good at is is judging our hearers and knowing that we can say John's team and be understood. So it's so it's a you know it's I mean it's kind of like so so we pronouns are like variables. I mean we're used to that. If 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 you meet your best friend sitting on the curb looking sad and you say what's wrong and he says she left me. If it's your best friend, you know who she is, right? You know, if, if it were out of the blue, it, you know, it could be anybody, right? So it's sort of that way with genitives. You know, if we use it, if we use John's team with somebody, uh, we w- we expect we we know them well enough to know that they'll know what we mean by the the relational variable inside that genitive. Is that the puzzle you were? Is that the puzzle you were pulling to? Yeah, yeah, that that sort of stuff. And, and when you say there about um, that sort of maybe background information or or shared understanding, that's that's also stuff that can um, sort of fill in like variables or the the reference of pronouns that might not otherwise be clear from context. Um, that's right. that seems right to you. We we depend we depend on that all the time, and and, and you can see it in the difference between our style talking to the people that we're close to versus the style you have to write if you're writing in an instruction manual or a textbook where, you know, you don't know who's reading it and you've got to be explicit. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, that all makes sense to me. Um, although it's, yeah, of course it gets much more complicated. Of course. Um, yeah. Okay. So I do want to move on to some, some other things. Maybe we'll come back to, some okay. stuff related to that. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah, one, one thing you discussed, which I found interesting, I hadn't really come across it before, concerned um, pronouns of laziness. Um, and as I understand that, um, uh, 
that that what a pronoun of laziness is roughly is that it's as a pronoun which is kind of treated as anaphoric uh, as if it, it's as if it gets its reference from elsewhere in the linguistic context but it, it doesn't or like it's kind of related to the other uh is that right for how it would be put roughly or yeah yeah it's i mean it's 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 problematic i mean we understand it but it's problematic how how we get it from what we can see in the linguistic structure by the way the linguist got that term from peter geech it was introduced i think it's in reference and generality uh, which was a, a book the linguist discovered early on and i think we we were we were passing it around in graduate school with as much excitement as as we were passing around catch 22 in that same period so now i can't i can't even remember now what were the first sort of classic examples put under the rubric of pronoun of laziness the term itself has had different uses and people don't all agree about exactly what it covers but i think um, donkey sentences and donkey pronouns were an early example. So, so if if you say uh, every farmer who owns a donkey beats it, and we have this it there, uh, well, it's a kind of a problem because we don't have just one donkey in the antecedent. We've got you know we've we've got this indefinite donkey owned by these quantified farmers. And it seems to mean something like every farmer who owns a donkey beats the donkey he owns. So it's it's kind of like there's this this invisible whole noun phrase sort of reconstructed in some mysterious way from the preceding sentence and serving as the interpretation for the pronoun. And donkey sentences became an industry. Once 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 our, it took a while for the theories to get sophisticated enough to see that that was a real problem, that that couldn't just be a nice bound variable sitting there under the scope of the some quantifier in the sentence. Um, so, so you had to get a pretty advanced theory for that even to become a problem. But once it became a problem, lots of people got got involved in it. And there's there's also the paycheck. Uh, Probably, I think those might have been invented by Lowry Kartunen, or he might have gotten them from somebody else. I forget, but he had he had a nice proposal for solving them. But these were these were examples like um, the man who gave his paycheck to his wife was wiser than the man who gave it to his mistress. I know people in the literature now find some more politically correct examples, but that was the original. <laughs> That's, so it's the one I, I remember best. Uh, and that and there's an it in there, the one who gave it to his mistress. Well, what's the it? Well, the only paycheck that's been mentioned was the, and all of this is kind of in a generic statement, but it was the, the paycheck that the first man gave to his wife, right? The man who gave his paycheck to his wife. Well, we don't mean that paycheck. Right, so... So we meet, we've got to have a new his in there, you know, wiser than the man who gave his respective paycheck to so and so. Uh, so there's a whole family of pro of puzzles with pronouns that they they neither just repeat the referent of something like John said he was sick, right? So he is John. You know that's a simple case, and they're not straightforward bound variables. So like like every Every uh, debater tries to show that he is right, where where it's just bound by the every every debater. But some of these others have these more complex seeming relations to the the structure that they evolve in. So that's yeah, that's 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 given us lots of. I mean, we love puzzles, <laughs> and those those non-standard pronouns have been wonderful puzzles for decades. I think most of them have been pretty well tamed by now. Not by yeah, I thought, yeah, <laughs> I thought, I thought you had maybe suggested that um, we could potentially handle a lot of these cases by um, um, extending the notion of, of pragmatic uh, pronouns to cover them. Or, I'm not sure I really understood it. Is that, 
Does that seem right to you? Or yeah. Um, let me think. Yeah, I I did have the notion of pragmatic pronouns. Uh, that's a no. I'm think that's a different kind of case. So I think where I introduced the notion of pragmatic pronouns is in things like. Um, uh, Several, uh, not every student could make it to the, not every student could make it to the meeting because they had a big exam the next day. Now that they has no direct relation and, and we can't even paraphrase it very well. It's, it's like take, we, we do something like taking the domain of the quantifier the student, the set of students. And maybe we then, and we know it's it's a restricted quantifier. We know, we know we're not talking about every student in the world. We're talking about every student in a given context. So then we can easily say, ah, that they, that's picking up that context domain. That's the students had a big exam the next day. Or even the students who didn't make it to the meeting had a big exam the next day. Um, and plural pronouns especially are good at, are, are very liberal at, at picking up, like almost any common noun can, can license a they, which refers to things of that kind. Like, like I don't want an apple because they make me sick. You know, then it's just, okay, because apples make me sick. Something like that. There, was, there wasn't any plural antecedent, but there was, there was the noun apple, and so you can take apples as the antecedent. I think those were the ones I was calling pragmatic. Yeah. But, well, but once again, we don't know where the line is between ones where there's a, a syntactic story to tell with a, with a rule-governed reconstruction of a, of a certain kind of definite description from some antecedent context, or whether we're doing this kind of uh, more pragma partly pragmatic operation. But but there's a big difference between singulars and plurals. With with the plurals, it's easy to play pragmatic games. Fair enough. Yeah, did did you um did you work a lot on like the pragmatic side of things, or do you just mostly just focus on the kind of formal semantics? Or um, um, I was I focused on the semantics, but I was. I was often led toward pragmatics, and so and and a number number of my students were very interested in pragmatics, and I encouraged that. But from my UCLA days, that was my first position from 1965 to 72. Um, Larry Horn was one of my PhD students there, and he's a pioneer in pragmatics, and and he he uh, he started out working in generative semantics approach that I I didn't agree with, so. So I fought with him. We fought a lot as he worked on his dissertation, and I, I encouraged him, and I challenged him, and I, I criticized him and, 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 and encouraged him. And I think he wrote one of the best generative semantics dissertations uh, that was written. But he, he, he got very interested in negation. That was his first big topic, and it's still one of his big, big topics. And that absolutely led him into looking at pragmatics and semantics and how they interact. And another one of my graduate students here at UMass, this was in the mid-80s, was Nirit Kadmon. And she's the author of one of the first, well, I think the first textbook to be titled Formal Pragmatics. And, and she, was, she was very much interested in presupposition, pre, presupposition projection, and also some of this reconstruction, reconstructed antecedents for pronouns. Um, and how how domains of quantifiers get restricted partly pragmatically. Um, so, you know, if if she had nice examples like, like, sure, I have two chairs you can borrow. They're on the porch. And it doesn't mean that there's only two chairs on the porch, right? And so, how, exactly how that works is, you know, there's there's constraints. I mean, not just anything goes. So, so part of the task is figuring out this whole range of examples and and how they work. So she she did she did beautiful stuff in that domain. 
Yeah, that's that's good stuff. I mean, actually, yeah, some of the early stuff I got into in in, in philosophy was some of this pragmatic stuff from like, you know, um, Austin and 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 Searle and some other people, and yeah. Um, yeah. I found that very interesting. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, but the the formal side is yeah, yeah. Well, and prag- I mean, parts of many parts of pragmatics can be formalized, and the line. I mean, I mean, I think nowadays people don't try to draw a sharp line between semantics and many parts of pragmatics. Even Montague didn't. You know, back in the end of the 60s, one of his papers was called Formal Pragmatics. For him, that really meant dealing with the, the deictic terms, the I, I here, now, and the, and the demonstratives like they, this, that, those, um, and, and putting, putting context putting context into the things that you evaluate expressions relative to. So you evaluate an expression with respect to a possible world, a moment of time, but maybe also with respect to a context of use. And so, because you have to, I mean, the, the I and the here, that they're, they absolute, they're crucial to the content of a sentence, but they absolutely depend on the context of use. So you've got to get that much pragmatics into your semantics or you won't be able to have truth conditions for lots of sentences. Good. Yeah, you mentioned the 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 deictic there, and that's um, often contrasted with the anaphoric. And um, as I understand the distinction, roughly, um, the anaphoric, um, say, of, of like for a pronoun, say, yep. um, of some term like she, is such that the referent um, is fixed by I don't know, other features of, of the linguistic context, maybe uh, the referent was named previously or something like that. And then the dectic uh, or uh, is, is fixed some other way, maybe like demonstratively or indexically or something else like that. Is that right? Or how do you? That, yeah, that that's approximately right. I mean, the, the dictic are fixed. I mean, if you look at it literally, the dictics are fixed by pointing, but there isn't always a physical pointing. But it's a non-linguistic gesture or an implicit gesture. It's it's non-linguistic. Um, so you're looking outside the content. You, you, you're not you're not looking back at the previous words. You're you're looking at the context in which the speech act is occurring. Whereas the anaphoric, in its simplest, most basic cases, is looking back at something else in the speech content. I mean, I mean, of course. Of course, the lines are not simple because when you have, when you have multi-sentence discourses, it's not clear if you have a pronoun later in the discourse, it's not clear whether you should say we're going back to the first occurrence of the noun phrase that introduced that referent or whether by now the context has been updated so that this is a salient person you know, in, in the context that we're talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it can get kind of tricky. I mean, do, do you think that all, um, or at least all sort of intelli- intelligible use of pronouns fall into these categories, or could there, is there some other potential linguistic category there, if that makes sense? Uh, there are. Um, so there are impersonal pronouns, like, like um, how do you get to Chicago from here? That That you... That you is very similar to the the impersonal pronoun one, which is more formal. You know, how does one get to Chicago from here? Those those are are special. They they're not they're not picking up specific values from either the linguistic or non linguistic context. They're 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 almost generic in in some sense. They're, um, so that's that's another kind, and I, there's probably still there's probably still more. Right. Okay. So it's not meant to be. Yeah, that makes sense. It's not meant to be exhaustive or anything yeah. like that. But, uh, yeah. Um, is there is there much um, um, that we can learn with this sort of distinction in mind? Is there like interesting topics in, in linguistics um, that come out of thinking about the anaphoric and the deictic? Or... Um. Well, I mean, 
<laughs> on the one hand, everything turns out to be interesting. You just dig a little, <laughs> and you find that every every question connects to every other question. So, but um, but let me see. You want you'd like something more informative than that. Uh, Well, yeah. I mean, so I look back at progress that's been made in in the earliest work on syntax before we had any real semantics. Everybody thought that, and in fact, the, the kind of traditional grammar books sort of talk that way, that a pronoun is just a substitute for a noun, right? That that was kind of the common understanding. It's it's to avoid repetition, and that that works for. John as an antecedent and then a he, and it works for very little else. Um, so really, yeah, really anaphora has been one of the diagnostics for understanding how quantification works, for how to distinguish referential from non-referential, for how to think about what's the real difference between indefinite and definite noun phrases, like a man and the man. So so those are those are really big questions of the whole area of reference and quantification and generalization and the and and looking at looking at how the pronouns work has has made a lot of theory stand or fall by by what happens when you when you try to see how they deal with anaphora and that's just ordinary anaphora with pronouns there's another whole industry for verb phrase anaphora. You know, John, um, let's see, here's a nice ambiguous sentence. Uh, John loves his wife and Bill does too. Um, that's, that's verb phrase anaphora. Uh, so uh, it can mean, it can mean John loves John's wife and Bill loves John's wife too. John loves his wife and Bill does too. That's where you take that first his wife and kind of treat it as just referring to his wife, right? But to get the other interpretation, John loves his wife and Bill loves his wife, right? Then you have to go back and look, well, how do we get that out of that first sentence? Well, the first sentence on some level can have another analysis that I I would paraphrase it logically, although this isn't what the syntax would look like as something like, John is an ex, such that X loves X's wife, and Bill is too. So it's like, even it, even though John loves his wife, that his wife doesn't, you don't see anything that looks quantificational in that sentence. It just looks like a simple sentence with two referential noun phrases. When you look at how the verb phrase in Afro works, you're led to go back and see that the structure of John loves his wife can can also be more similar to the structure of every man loves his wife, where we we really know it's quantified. So yeah, yeah, pronouns, pronouns are are key to a whole lot of things. I mean, they're they're fun by themselves, and and just to try to just to try to get them to work right, really tests your theories of of all kinds of other things. Yeah, good stuff. Um, and and you've been sort of talking about a bunch of this already. But I, what do you, what do you think of some of the? I'm um, just as a general question, some of the um, important advances or progress has been made in uh, in formal semantics and linguistics. Um, ah, big, the biggest questions are somehow hardest to to yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, well, one of the one of the early one of the early ones that was really important was if you go all the way back to Chomsky's syntactic structures, which was what I was raised on, and, and even in, in the later aspects of the that was fifty seven and aspects of the theory of syntax in nineteen sixty five, in both of those, the theory of how we build up, how we construct complex sentences from parts was really a theory of kernel sentences and how they get put together. So it's simple simple sentences that are themselves complete sentences and ways to put them together. And that, when, when we started 
when, when we started working on semantics and to try to get the semantics of these sentences from their syntactic structure, one of the things that emerged early on from looking at sentences with quantifiers in them, and this was this was very salient in the work of Montague and the work of David Lewis, um, was if you're going to have complex sentences with quantifiers in them, you better not be trying to build up all your complex sentences from closed sentences. So let me let me give an example just to illustrate that. Um, so in in Chomsky's early syntax, um, uh, a simple sentence like "John tried to win" comes from two simple little kernel structures. John tried something. John win. And and when you turn the when you put them together, you turn the embedded one into an infinitive to win. And you substitute that for this complement of John tried. Uh, well, look at the quantified sentence, like um, every man tried to win. If that came from every man tried something and every man win, it should mean something like every man tried for every man to win. That's not what it means, right? And it turned out there were lots of examples like that where they, they it was working just fine to just operate with closed sentences as long as all the noun phrases were just proper names or definite descriptions. But when the noun phrases included indefinites and quantified noun phrases and things, that, then, then the semantics just went totally screwy. And and like like every number is even or odd would have been derived from every number is even or every number is odd. No, not if you want. To, not if you want to get the semantics from the structure, right? Um, so, so one one way to to uh, one one sort of blanket way to rectify that is to realize that some of the constituent parts are something more like open sentences, or or lambda abstracts of open sentences. That there's there's just like in logic, you know, that you build up to build up complex quantified sentences, you have open sentences at at many stages of the derivation. And the scope of a quantifier can dis, can extend down into an embedded sentence very very straightforwardly. So things like that happen in natural language too. So that was one big advance. And that was I mean, it was a big aha, and once it, once it was seen, then the syntacticians also changed their theory. So they have they have abstract elements they call pro, and big pro and little pro, and which function like variables. Uh, and in fact, I mean, it's gotten more sophisticated. The big the big pro in John tried pro leave. That's not only a variable; it's a de say kind of variable. <laughs> You know, it's sort of intrinsically connected with the with the higher uh, matrix uh, subject and and the attitude that's in there. Uh, so, uh, so so that was one really big one. Um, then there were lots of advances in the study of tense and aspect. I mean, yeah, it's not surprising. The earliest advances we were we were building on things that logicians understood, and we were seeing how they applied in natural language. Uh, but then then further further advances came in in paying attention to some things that natural language has that the logical languages don't have. Um, so uh, all the different uh, all the different kinds of speech acts, the que- questions, how do questions work? How do imperatives work? Uh, and and question questions are a fascinating fascinating domain. Lowry Carton and had the first article in the first issue of Linguistics and Philosophy, and it was on the semantics of questions. And one of the one of the big methodological breakthroughs that he had made and that let him come up with a really beautiful theory of questions was that all the work before him, as far as I know, both by philosophers. Um, who who were uh, I'm trying to remember the name of a sweet Swedish philosopher who did a lot on questions. 
I'm blocking right now, but but there there'd been work on these non-declarative sentences, um, and they were they were all looking at questions where the question is a main clause. I mean the the whole the whole utterance is a question, and it was was looking at it in terms of putting some operators in that will operate on on what this what this clause is doing. And what Kartanen thought about was, well, what about embedded questions? Like, some of them are question-like also, like John asked Bill where he lived. Some of them are like answers to questions, like John knows where Bill lives. Some of them are, are neither, like John wonders where Bill lives, or even... Carton even even worked on these complicated things like, like, uh, whether John will come to the party may depend on who else we invite. Where it's like question depends on question, and Carton realized that there were all in all of these different constructions, the question construction was the same, and to figure out what's really in the semantics of the question itself as opposed to the pragmatics of asking. That you can figure out better if you work on the embedded questions first. And then and then separately, then then you can then you then you can figure out what's the actual semantic content of this question thing. Which which uh, the consensus quickly emerged that it was one of two things. It it was either the set the set of all possible answers to the given question. That's the semantic content of the question. Or the set of all true answers to the given question. And and you could sort of make your theory work either way, and there were fights for a long time about, about that. But but you have this kind of set of prop so a question denotes a set of propositions. And then the then the pragmatics of asking a question is really um Presenting this set of propositions to your interlocutor and and telling him to pick the pick the one, tell me which one of these is the true is the true proposition. So that I mean that that was a that was a big advance and and it was both a big advance in understanding speech acts and their semantics and pragmatics and dividing semantics from pragmatics, and it was a great methodological advance. Look look at the embedded examples. And all the different contexts that can embed them to see what's what's the general property of this construction, and then if it can be used as a as a separate construction by itself as a sort of speech act, then see what what extra pragmatic ingredient goes with the with the speech act production. That that's just a couple of examples, and they're both from pretty early. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, that's, that's yeah. was that was that uh, this this the Swedish philosopher you're thinking of was that um, Leonard Akvist? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Thank you, yeah. Akvist. Yes, right. exactly. Right, yeah. right. Because he'd done a yeah, lot from, of the, on the pragmatics of of speech acts, and and he and others who followed him were were all in the same vein, putting something. And I mean, the generative semanticists who were syntacticizing all of these things. They had the deep structure for who, do, who does John love was something like, I, I request that you tell me the answer to who John loves or some, something like, I can't remember. I can't remember how to make it non-circular, but because there's a who, who John loves is down in there somewhere. But they, they, were, they were putting those speech act kind of properties into the deep structure, which some people still do, not only generative semanticists, um, but uh, yeah, yes, right. And then, well, like another example of big advance was was when um, Angelica Kratzer started putting the event argument into all kinds of sentences. I mean, there, other other people did it in various ways, but I think Angelica raised it to a new level. And you can you can look at her her article in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy for all the different doors that got opened up once once you, uh, once that Davidsonian event argument got recognized as something that's crucial in the semantics of lots and lots of 
constructions, that it's not enough to just work with times and tenses, that, that you need you need the events to, to, to really do things right, not just for tense and aspect. Right, good. And yeah, you've done some work on... Um on tense and aspect as well. And, um, um, I had, I had a kind of related question to that, which is that, um, I, I, you know, I like looking at things in the like philosophy of time, for example, you know, are there, are there instances of time? Is time dense? Is there objective <laughs> temporal becoming and so on? I, I wonder if any of that is at all relevant to, you know, understanding tense language. I mean, does our, yeah. Our language there make certain presuppositions of that sort or, or what, yeah, what do you think about that? My my uh, my previous husband Evan Bach uh, one of the one of the things that he wrote about was something he called natural language metaphysics. And and he said, look, we as linguists can't try to answer the philosophers questions of what there really is or you know what reality is really like, but we can ask related questions about what do our languages seem to have as built-in presuppositions? So, so what, it, what kinds of presuppositions about time, if any, are embodied in, in the way that tense tense systems work in in natural languages, uh, and are they all alike? Or is this something that languages can can differ on? Uh, I mean, he didn't he didn't he didn't come down with any single dogmatic answer to those questions but but uh, but he raised them and and he and and I think uh, Johann von Bentham did some work quite early on that was, I think this was where we first got to know him from showing that you could have models with discrete time and models with continuous time and you could embed either one in the other so he was kind of preempting anybody claiming that you know we had an absolute presupposition of one or the other which is good because we often seem to talk we talk equally naturally both ways you know we say and then and then and then you know with this uh, apparent discrete view of time but we also often talk as though time is flowing in a in a continuous manner uh, so yeah so so it's 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 relevant for uh, it's relevant for theories of tense and aspect and for looking across languages. I mean, Worf made some claims that some Hopis had some kind of circular time system, and we didn't. But I mean, that's it's easy to show that that we can express everything the Hopis were expressing, and they they could presumably express all the things. We express. I mean, I mean, we sometimes talk circularly. We say, "Oh, Christmas is here again," <laughs> and that's you know it keeps coming back once a year. So, so, uh, but, but they're all yeah, yeah. Natural language, natural language metaphysics is indeed a, a very interesting phenomenon. And and putting the event argument in is part of that, and then and then seeing what what properties it needs to have. Um, Yeah, you you say the the um, the event argument. Um, um, could you briefly describe that? What uh, oh, what is I, that? I'm, yeah, probably I would, yes, I was just presupposing. <laughs> right, right. So, so Davidson started this um, in a paper in the sixties, I think, um, with uh, arguing that a sentence like uh, Jones. Yeah, philosophers all use last names. Linguists all use first names. So it was Jones, yeah, not John. Uh, Jones buttered the toast in the bathroom at midnight with a knife. I think that was his example. And and he used arguments from the entailments that you could drop any one of those modifiers and it would be entailed by the rest. And no matter what the order, you know, in what order you, you dropped arguments uh, and various other arguments. Um, so... He, he argued uh, that the real logical form of that should have a variable over events and should be something like there exists an event E such that E 
is a buttering of the toast by John, and E occurred in the bathroom, and E occurred at midnight, and E was with a knife. I mean, I don't know if I can say that event was with a knife, but anyway, let's grant that. Uh, and and that and that basically a lot of these adverbials are just modifiers, predicates that you're predicating of the event. Uh, and that's all, adverbs have always been a puzzle. Reichenbach had an interesting theory of adverbs. I think he was one of the first philosophers to 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 have a lot of insights into the puzzles raised by adverbs and some ideas about how to solve them. Uh, but but adverbs are are puzzling. Uh, and so so Davidson's idea was that that the adverbs could just be like predicates conjoined. You know, they they could give you all these conjects of a sentence. There was there is an e such that e is of such and such event, and e was in the bathroom, and e was at midnight, et cetera. So, so for most of the adverbs seem to be extensional like that. They're just separable from from one another. Um, an adverb like intentionally can't be handled so si- so simple so so simply because it gets things in its scope, but. But lots and lots and lots of the adverbs can be, so so that's the event argument, and so then there there arose various neo Davidsonian theories. Terry Parsons uh, did a lot of work on uh, with the event argument, um, uh, and 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 into worrying about oh are events and states are they you know the same ontological type or are they different and if they're different how do they how do they relate. Um, so, so, uh, so, so then all sorts of sentences where you don't see any direct reference to an event are analyzed as having indirectly quantification over an event somewhere in their logical structure. And you can, you can put it in the syntax or you can just introduce it in the semantics. The theories, theories differ on that. Yeah, uh, good. I mean, we could explore that more, but I do want to cover uh, a couple other things before we f- before we uh, finish up. Um, yeah, so I'm. Um, do you have you thought much about more, um, say, basic questions about about meaning and, and less school meaning? Like, where, um, how is it that uh, individual terms like nouns or names and so on get their get their meaning and 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 how do you think about that in, in your formal semantics? So I I haven't thought a lot about it in my role as formal semanticist. I I think I mean, Montague had a very interesting strategy that I think was not crazy. He he made a sharp distinction between lexical items and the structure. And for the lexical items, he figured it was the job of the semantics to f- semanticist to figure out their logical type. So and we haven't talked much about type structure, but it's it's really crucial for how you how you build things up compositionally. So the simplest cases are you have you have names that denote entities and you have things that are predicates that combine with them to make something that denotes a truth value. But you ha- may have adjectives that are are a function from First order properties to f- other first order properties, um, and all sorts of other kinds of kinds of types. Um, and and uh, Montague Montague figured, okay, we have to figure out what's the what's the logical type of each verb in terms of the number and kinds of arguments it takes. What's the logical type of various modifiers? Um, but we don't have to figure out the difference between two different lexical items of the same type. That's that could be somebody else's job. You know, say there's a lexicographer, but let let there be let there be lexicographers, um, and and we'll just put in variables. I mean, we'll or or con- or constants. Something, and we'll say, okay, walk. Walk denotes some property. They call it walk prime. Run denotes some property. Call it run prime. 
And so, so John walks is you know, whatever the denotation of run is applies to whatever the denotation of John is. Uh, it's a, and it will be true if the denotation of John is in the denotation of runs and false otherwise. So, so you you stop at the. I mean, you build everything up from the lexical level, but you don't say what the actual content is. So when you're giving the truth conditions, you're always giving them conditionally, dependent on what the semantic values of the actual lexical items are. That's that's part of that's part of what's behind my earlier statement that you could look at formal semantics as the semantics of syntax, because. You you have to feed you have to feed in values for the lexical items if you want to actually get truth conditions of the whole actual sentence. Uh, now, as time has progressed, of course, it's become obvious that you can't you cannot ignore everything about the meanings of the lexical items. So, one clear case is mass nouns versus count nouns. They're both nouns. Water water is a mass noun. Book is a count noun. They behave differently syntactically and semantically, and there's you know there's lots of things they have in common. Some some quantifiers uh, can go like a quantifier like most can apply both to plural count nouns and to mass nouns, uh, but a quantifier like every can only apply to count nouns. So so we have to we have to work on the issue of okay what is the semantic difference between a count noun and a mass noun, and it, and that's not trivial. And there's been lots of work on that. In the in the work, the earlier work had been done by philosophers, and I think I think because set theory and first order logic had such a grip on everybody's conception of what meaning would end up looking like, count nouns were considered most basic, because those are the the those are the things that are that there can be sets of those are the things that the it's it's the things in the domain it's the things in the denotation of a count noun like book or or man that our quantifiers range over so, and how we quantify over mass stuff that seemed like the mystery so so early theories of mass nouns certainly all the ones i know of from philosophers um came we're we're trying to trying to analyze mass nouns in terms of, say, quantities of matter, where quantity itself is a count noun that you could quantify over. And it was linguists who noticed that, oh, there's a lot of languages in the world that don't make a grammatical distinction between mass and count. And in those languages, the nouns all work as mass. And if you want to quantify, you have to add something like a classifier you know, like three piece cow <laughs> or something. Um, so you have to you have to add something to turn a ma- a, these massy nouns into countable things. So then that so it was the linguists who suddenly said, "Aha, we've got to find a theory of mass and count that that lets the mass nouns be basic and the count nouns add something." And I think. But then it was a logician, Godard Link, who, who I think came up with the first solution. But the linguists had found the problem, <laughs> and and this desideratum on the problem. So Link came up with the idea that that both kinds of nouns, their denotations, can be thought of as something like Boolean semilattices, where the count nouns, their denotations, had to be atomic semilattices. And the mass nouns had no requirement of atomicity, and that's really neat because the structures are very similar. It's you can nicely explain why, which quantifiers can apply to both, and why, and which are restricted to, which ones presuppose atomicity and can only apply to count domains. Uh, so it's really, and and it, and it then show you can go on to show why plurals have so much in common with mass nouns as opposed to singulars. And you can get a single meaning for the that applies to the boy, the boys, and the water. And that's pretty cool. You know, that anybody who wasn't convinced before, you know, has got to be convinced when when you see how neatly that works. So yeah, yeah, there yeah, there's another there's another example of there's another example of a big advance 
that came from seeing, okay, we've got to think about this part of lexical meaning. And and similarly in the verbs, you know, for you, you need to think about a lot of aspects of verbs meanings to to be able to get tense and aspect and how adverbs combine with verbs, what happens with modifiers like almost. You know, they, they force you to to get into thinking about some of the some of the innards of the lexical meanings. Yeah, good. That's the that's helpful, and and also on on some of these terms you've discussed, uh, like like quantifier terms, like like many and few. Um, yeah, they're they're not only potentially vague and context dependent as they as they surely are, but there's also maybe an ambiguity between a cardinal reading and a proportional reading. Yep. So if, like for example, yeah, like many people have brown hair. Is that saying that there's a large number of people that have brown hair? What where what counts as large is maybe context dependent but or is it saying something like well of all the people that have brown hair like some significant proportion of them have brown hair of all the people um, have right. yeah <laughs> of all the people that yeah sorry of all the people that have hair maybe <laughs> um, right yes. personally I, I'm, I'm happy to say that that maybe that the term here like the terms many and few and so on is they're polysemous they have different they have multiple meanings and Maybe sometimes it's un- unclear on occasion which which meaning yep. is being used, but um, I don't know. What, what, what do you what do you think about this uh, problem? Well, yeah that that was one that was one that I worked on. It was really fun because because and it's and it's really something rather specific to those very quantifiers, many and few. It's it doesn't apply to a lot of quantifiers uh, that they're vague because they're vague and context dependent. It it would seem as though it doesn't matter whether you you resolve that ambiguity as saying large number of people have brown hair or or a large proportion of the people who have have hair have brown hair because it's it's going to be vague either way. So if it's true on one reading, you can set the parameter, you know, either the n or the n percent. You can set the parameter so it will be true on the other reading. Uh, so. So discovering that it really made a difference was kind of exciting, and then uh, I think I think dis- discovering that there really was an ambiguity in addition to the vagueness was at least as exciting as figuring out a solution. <laughs> uh, and the and the solution that I came up with was not the last word. I had even noticed some some little problems that I noted at the very very end of my paper. That then generated a lot more literature because it took a lot of work to try to, to try to solve them, um, but it was uh, it was the kind that was the kind of question that could not become a serious question until there had been a lot of work on the properties of generalized quantifiers. So that now that that's a technical notion that I I probably shouldn't try to get into um, in any detail, but. It was it was one of the th- things that both Montague and David Lewis did. I think Montague first, but almost at almost at the same time, and they could have been talking to each other. Uh, this idea that you could unify the meanings of noun phrases, like John, the man, every man, they could all be of the same semantic type, even though it looks like John or the man just denotes an entity, and every man. I mean, Russell said, well, that's, that doesn't denote anything at all. The meaning of every man is spread out in the structure of the sentence. You know, for a quantifier and an if-then and all that. Russell, Russell thought natural language was not well-behaved to be putting things like every man in the same syntactic category as John or the man. Um, so, uh, so, so this discovery that with a higher logical type with the noun phrase denoting a set of properties, you could let John denote the set of all the properties that that individual has. You could let every man denote the set of all those properties that are shared by every man. Some man denotes the set of properties that at least one man has. No man denotes the set of properties that no man has. Uh, so with that kind of paraphrase, which which in the formal terms you do with lambdas, uh, you you can get all those noun phrases of the same type, 
And then when you combine them with a predicate, like is happy, instead of the usual, instead of the structure we see in a simple sentence like John is happy, where the predicate applies to the subject, in this case, it's it, we're saying happy is a member of the set of properties that this subject noun phrase has. So it turns the predication, turns the order of the predication around the generalized quantifier subject, every man, no man, John, or whatever, is predicated of the verb phrase property, is happy. Uh, so uh, let me see, what was it? What was the question for which I had to back up to that? Because um, I, I lost my track. Uh, <laughs> ah, the many and few. Thank you, thank you. Yes. So, so that that couldn't even have been. I don't think that could have even been noticed if we didn't have the theory of generalized quantifiers and the work of people like Ed Keenan and Barwise and Cooper. That was a wonderful logician linguist pair, John Barwise and Robin Cooper. Uh, exploring properties of generalized quantifiers, finding some universal properties that all these generalized quantifiers have, and so it's constraints on what's a possible noun phrase meaning in natural language, and then also also finding all these interesting properties that some generalized quantifiers have and others don't. And in, in Barlas and Cooper's paper, there was a big table with a lot of quantifiers and then all these properties and plus, minus, plus, minus, et cetera. And, and in the columns for many and few, they had some asterisks that said the two authors disagreed on some of these properties. And something else had led me to suspect there was actual an actual ambiguity. I, I can't remember now which example it was. Um, uh, I think I think it was that you could say few ling few children came to the last linguistics department party, um, but all the chi all the children came to the linguistics party. There just were few children, um, but if you if you said few of the children came to the, uh, that's, this is not the perfect example. Um, but, but it was like, few could be, few could be all. And that was kind of a puzzle. Because if few is proportional, it couldn't be all. But cardinal few could be all. That, that, that was, that was one cue that maybe there was a cardinal reading as well as a proportional reading. But, but anyway, so, so once, once I, once I, collected these various arguments. Some of them came from, from some of the students who were in a seminar that Hans Kamp and I were teaching that, that semester. Um, when, when I realized there could be an ambiguity there, that explained why Barwise and Cooper were getting these conflicting judgments of which formal properties these two quantifiers had, because the, the proportional quantifiers have different properties from the cardinal quantifiers, and they were looking at different examples and getting different intuitions for them. And that was resolved by, by finding that it was ambiguous. Yeah, that was fun. I like, I like going, uh, can I interrupt? I, I like going back and forth between, between some, some topics I've worked on. I really feel like I'm, I'm in a swamp and I'm pulling my hair out. I, I, there were various times in my career where I was working on problems of semantics of belief sentences. And that was, that, that seemed like I could never get solutions that made me happy. And then I'd, I'd, I'd come out of that and work on something like conjunction and generalized conjunction or the ambiguity of many and few. And it's like, oh boy, you know, this isn't, these questions are not as deep. I certainly acknowledge that right up front, but oh boy, they're solvable. <laughs> And and we learned something, yeah. You know, so it's yeah. So I like both. I I remember being at a at a philosophy and linguistics conference decades ago, where uh, 
there was a, a little round table about research problems of various kinds and and the the topic of belief sentences came up and and somebody said uh, nobody should even try to work on belief sentences for the next ten years and and then I stuck up my hand and I said I thought I think anyone who doesn't have tenure should be warned off of belief sentences but anybody who does have tenure should feel some obligation to try once in a while. <laughs> There's been progress since then. It's not doesn't feel quite so hopeless now, but my my attempts were not great, but I couldn't I couldn't not try sometimes. <laughs> yeah, good. I, I was actually going to ask like um um what are some of the kind of major puzzles or or problems in, in linguistics that have um well, you've had difficulty grappling with or that you think have been persisting uh, problems in in the field. Yeah. Well, well, the 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 propositional attitudes certainly have been uh, for a long time. For a long time, linguists didn't work on them at all because because there there was no there was there was no syntactic problem. You just have a verb and then a that clause, and and the uh, and the the problem of well, what is the what's the relation of the verb to the content of the that clause? That really felt more like a philosophical problem, and we were mostly happy to leave it to the philosophers. Uh, but but eventually, eventually, linguists got into that too, and that's that's another area where Angelica Kratzer has made, you know, a, a lot of really really important progress, and and the 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 poss the possibilities are wider than they used to be. Uh, it's 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 possible that the relation of the the sentence inside that that clause to what you take to be the content of the attitude is much more indirect than we were trying to make it. I mean, when I when I was working on it, I thought if it's compositional, we've got to figure out what if if the if the content is a proposition, which was the obvious first choice, then we have all the problems of hyperintentionality that that two sentences that are logically equivalent would denote the same proposition because they pick out the same set of possible worlds. And that doesn't go well for belief sentences. Um, but if you, try to, if you try to make them look more like quotations to get the form of the sentence to matter, that, that raised other problems. And so, so I think, I mean, insofar as I made any contributions, it was it was pinpointing some of the problems that were arising from the various natural hypotheses that one could one could think of uh, but and and even i mean in a broader sense jerry foder back in those years was advocating a kind of methodological solipsism in approach to all thought of sentence meaning that meanings had to be inside the head of the speaker and and I just I challenged him with sentences with belief sentences where there were two occurrences of a demonstrative that like John believes that that is better than that and no solipsistic account of the meaning of that embedded sentence can get you any kind of handle because that is pointing at something outside the sentence and and so you've got to you've got to have something more than what's in the speaker's head, and the belief sentences were some of the best arguments um, for that. But um, yeah, so so, so yes, yeah, so that that was certainly a big problem, and uh, and Angelica and others have made made really really great progress on that, and a lot of philosophers have too. I have I've, I no longer keep can keep up with with all of what's been done. Um, Context dependence remains an important problem because how how exactly to individuate contexts is not clear, um, and how much you should try to is not clear. I don't I don't know how to say that in a way that's that that makes it very clear. Um, Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, I mentioned solving the problem of the 
of the indeterminacy of the possessive phrases by putting a free variable in there. And there's there are some approaches to some kinds of semantic problems where I see people putting in a lot of free variables in a lot of places, and I think, well, at what point could you be accused of cheating? You know, that, that you have a problem and you put in a variable. <laughs> uh, so, so, so at the same time, it's really nice that people are working on constraints on possible semantics for natural language. That's that's in its infancy. The the study of universals and typology um, is in its infancy, and I'm sure it's going to become much more sophisticated. Because just as in the earliest years of of Chomsky and syntax, the grammars of other languages were written in a way that made them look an awful lot like English, plus a few transformational rules that would turn them into something else. And something similar may happen in semantics with with people taking what's been done on some construction in English and and analyzing things in other languages to make it look kind of like English with some quirks. And there've been Lisa Mathewson has done some has argued that uh, I've forgotten which construction, uh, but that she was working on a native language of the Pacific Northwest and arguing that the way you should analyze this construction there, uh, quite different from English, that it really might be better to an- analyze the English things more like that. You know, so so there's there's getting to be some real back and forth and some serious study of of the semantics of really wide ranges of language. There's that's that's a wide open area, and more and more linguists are doing sophisticated um, field work with semantics as well as syntax, um, and 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 sign language also sign language, seeing what's what's common, what's different in the different modalities. Um, so this is not this this is not so much in the realm of specific puzzles as in the realm of ways in which new frontiers in which new work can be done that enriches what we know about how language works. Yeah, very good. I mean, do you think that um, another thing that I, I think about as a kind of difficult uh, topic in, in, in linguistics and semantics is various like modal terms like can and cannot and must, yeah. must oh. not, stuff like that. And um, yes, is, that, is, is this something you've thought about very much or um, in terms of understanding these linguistics? I, I've not worked on that nearly as much as other people, but there, there's a big, yeah, there's a lot of people right now working on the the epistemic modals and the the relation between the epistemic modals and, and other epistemic markers that you find in different languages. Lots of languages have lots of different ways to signal what your what your source is for what you're saying, whether it's firsthand knowledge or hearsay or whatnot. And, and that, that relates to some of what we do with modals or what other languages do with modals. Um, and, and yeah, yes, uh, that, that's another domain in which Angelica Kratzer was one of the, the pioneers in her, her classic paper on what must and can, must and can mean, uh, with all, all the work on the modal base and the ordering source and, 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 and showing that you can have, I mean, in that earliest work of hers, you could have rather uniform form of the meaning of modals and and locate the interesting differences among them in these parameters that they brought with them in terms of of what kinds of accessibility relations between worlds and what kind of preference orderings like like for the deontic modals you have to have notion of the best worlds etc so yes yes and 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 now that now that people have worked on languages where things look quite different, that that domain is is tremendously rich, and there's papers on that at almost every semantics conference. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's good stuff. Yeah, um, I know I could keep um, asking sort of related and, and other questions in 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 linguistics and, and semantics here, but I do I do want to I do want to wrap up soon and. Um, I like to end with a kind of general meta philosophical question. Um, 
And yeah, so I mean, what do you think is the um, the value of this of this sort of work of this of, of philosophy, I guess, generally and and uh, linguistics and, and semantics specifically? Why is it um, worth doing, at least at least to you? Um, I'll, I'll give I'll give a double answer. One one is I definitely think it's interesting and important, but but that it, importance has never been why. I did it. I mean, I've, I've, I've done, I've worked on all the things I've worked on because they were so much fun, and I, and I consider myself really, really lucky to have found an area to work in that's just full of puzzles that delight me. My brother was a baseball player, and our, so our lives were very different. But, but we, we realized we had that in common that we were able to make a living doing something that we just loved doing. Right? Uh, so, but okay, but why? Why why are they interesting and valuable? Well, okay, broadest answer is anything that gets us closer to the truth of anything, about anything is valuable. But that's that's too broad to be interesting. Uh, uh, linguists are very much motivated by the idea that we're uncovering things about the human capacity for language as a really important part of cognitive science more generally. And what, it, what is it that makes humans human? What is, it, what is it that makes babies able to do this miraculous thing that they do in their first couple of years of mastering this system that turns out to be just unimaginably complex? I mean, until you try to write down the grammar of the language that they have, even by age three, you don't realize what a what an amazing, what amazing little innate scientists they are to 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 figure out the the structure of the the language surrounding them. Uh, so, so that's that. Just I mean, when when I have to write grant proposals, you know, of course I have to say why things are important and worth <laughs> worth somebody paying me money money to work on, and and that's that's always a, a huge part of it, and and that that requires. That requires understanding everything, everything about language, and and we've always got to be part of teams because we've got to always find this division of labor of what what is part of the our linguistic competence and what is coming from some broader competence that's not just linguistic. Uh, so so we work on the ling- linguistic part, but we always have to be in communication with people who are working on other parts. Like, like I, I can remember back when it seemed, it seemed really linguistically, a, a kind of linguistically spectacular universal, that that there was a small set of color terms that could be arranged in a kind of hierarchy such that if a language had anything besides black and white, it would have red, and if it had had anything besides black, white, and red. I forget exactly how the others went. It would have either blue or yellow next, and then next would be green. And like, how could this be so universal? Well, turns out that comes from the structure of color vision, right? Um, that that you what's what's innate is the is is color vision, and 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 the the linguistic terms follow what's salient from our from our color vision. So we we had to learn from somewhere else that that was not. Not straightforwardly a linguistic universal, at least not in terms of explaining it. And so, so that's 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 why that's that's why I think linguistics is important. Philosophy, I I mean, I always have thought philosophy is important because philosophers think really deeply about the questions they think about, and and clarify what those questions are really about, and certainly in semantics. We got a huge amount of insight from what philosophers before us had done. I mean, what my work really was, my, my path was I my my training was with Chomsky in syntax. At my first job at UCLA, David Lewis introduced me to Montague, and I discovered what Montague was doing, and I thought, oh, we need that. Uh, can can we can we can we find a way to use that? So so I I had this mission, you know, can I, can I put Chomsky and Montague together? And that was, that was the way I initially defined uh, my task. 
the syntax we use now isn't necessarily always Chomsky. There's debates about which syntax is best, but but still, still that that was coming from the whole tradition of logic and philosophy of language. And I've mentioned a whole lot of particulars along the way, like the Davidsonian event argument, or or uh, things that Reichen, Reichenbach noticed certain things about aspect first, and 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 so the, the philosophers might not look at, at as many examples as the linguists do, but when they look at them, they they look deeply and hard, and we have had had a huge amount of input from philosophy into into formal semantics. The first. The first ten years were all collaborative, you know, because the philosophers didn't know all the syntactic stuff that the linguists knew, and the lingu- linguists didn't know all the all the logic and the 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 philosophy of language basics that the philosophers knew. So, so, so the early years were very collaborative. I, I was really luck. I felt really lucky that Terry Parsons came to UMass the same year I did, and that our first. Our first half dozen or so PhD students, you know, that was the two of us on, on the on as the main members of their their committees, and 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 it was all it was all very collaborative, and then and and then I think the linguists have have by now contributed back into philosophy with with the uh, insights in what the structure of the language is really like, so f- philosophers of language who don't keep up with that maybe, not may go off on wrong tracks. So so it's still it's still in, there there's more autonomy, but it's still important to to keep in touch. Daniel Altschuler's just this week has published a beautiful book book called Linguistics Meets Philosophy, in which he, he got people to write on a whole bunch of topics and on each topic he has a linguist and a philosopher contributing an article. Uh, and 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 he, he got me to write it a uh, historical preface on the interactions of linguists and philosophers through the before and through the early development of formal semantics and that was fun to go back and and look at all that and see through the years you know all the ways we've interacted and still do yeah that's that's um uh, that's great yeah i like the way you you put all that so i guess um yeah, we'll wrap up the questions there. Thanks, thanks so much for for coming on here and taking my questions, and you know for all the work that you see you do and you've done. And uh, yeah, it's been great. It's been great having you. Well, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed it very much.